Well, hey, good morning and welcome to The Gathering. My name is John and I am so happy and thankful that you chose to spend your Sunday morning here with us online today. And so um, I want to invite you and encourage you today to participate with us as we worship um, our King and our Lord this morning. I know that it's really easy when we start watching things online to slip into consume mode. But today I want to encourage you to actively participate and to engage with us today. Day. And so we're going to sing a few songs. And as we do, I want to invite you to sing with us, to worship our God and to praise him for he is good and he is worthy of our worship. And I know that in a season like this, it's easy to forget sometimes that God is good, but he is just as good today as he was yesterday and he'll be just as good tomorrow. And so we're going to praise him and worship him. So wherever you are, however you are gathered today, um, you may be in your living room, your bedroom, it doesn't really matter. I want to encourage you to sing out and to worship our God this morning. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get singing together. Um, God, we just thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that you are good, that you are holy, that you are righteous. Um, God, we thank you that you are sovereign, that you are over all things. And we just ask that you would be with us today as we worship you, as we seek you, um, as we um, are striving to grow into the people you are calling us to be. Um, God, I know that in this situation and in this season, it's easy for us to find ourselves confu uh, consumed with fear and doubt and worry and stress. Um, but God, I ask that this morning you just remove those things and you remind us and you show us um, that you are good and that you are in control. And uh, God, we just ask that you be glorified um, today. God, wherever we're gathered, wherever we are worshiping you today, um, we ask that you would be present and you would be with us. God, we love you and we thank you so much for who you are. And it's in your name that we pray and we sing. Amen. Let's sing together. In peace, you bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break. At your name, still, you call the sea to still, rage in me to still. At your name, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. 
that the shadows can't deny Your name cannot be overcome To break every chain, to break every chain. And there is power in the name of Jesus. And there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, to break every chain. Good morning and thanks for joining us. I'm Steve Duzo and I'm the Connections Pastor here at The Gathering. I'd like to start out by sharing a few ways you can stay connected throughout the week. The first way is through our daily devotional. It's a great way to start the morning out with God. You can watch together and comment. Uh, The second way is to stay connected as a family. You can do this by watching our kids worship and kids activity. Great way to stay connected as a family. And the third way is through our Right Now Media recommendations. And if you don't have Right Now Media, if you comment below, we can make sure to help you out. And and I know some of you who are watching right now may be new or maybe you aren't connected to the gathering. Uh, If this is you, I'd like to ask a favor. Would you please fill out our Get Connected link that you'll see below or right now in the posts? Um, If you do, I I would love to send you a thanks for watching and uh, send you some ways to get connected. We'll also make sure and put up a post after the service is over uh, that you can follow that Get Connected link. So thank you for joining us this morning, and let's please continue to worship together. Thanks.
morning gathering family I'm so excited to be with you today uh, want to get us started just by saying a couple of thank yous first of all huge thank you to our staff team uh, I kind of was pushy with them this week saying I really want the sermon part of our service to be live uh, because I want to be able to interact with you and uh, they have worked so hard to make it possible for us to put all of that together 
And, and I'm really grateful to Matt, who's switching everything for us, uh, to John, who led us in worship just now, and that was just fantastic. Steve's doing so much of the connecting work. And, and then Kelly has put together a great children's program, not just through the week, but today as well. If you didn't get to see it this morning, after we're done here, go back and watch the video from Kids Club this morning with Mr. Allen doing some teaching. He did a fantastic job. So just thank you to everybody. Uh, I'm really glad to be here with you this morning. It's a little different, uh, but that's okay. Uh, I, I love our Sunday mornings on Yankee Street. Uh, the opportunity to see you in person, to share Bill's donuts and coffee with you. Uh, but also, I love preaching on Sundays. Uh, because I can look into your eyes. I can I can feel like I'm connected to you, like we're having a conversation. Um, and so I miss that. And I'm looking forward to getting back to that, uh, hopefully not too long from now. Uh, but this is fun, too, because uh, this is a little bit more informal, the opportunity for us to interact a little bit. So I, I'm going to be a little more informal, a little more casual this morning. Uh, you'll see look over here every so often because I want to try to follow some of your contacts if you can and say hi and I can see that some of you like my coffee mug. So uh, there's my Winnie the Pooh mug. Uh, it's my favorite coffee mug here at home. Uh, but uh, I, I'm excited about this morning. Uh, in just a minute, we'll start talking about God's provision for us. And so here's a question you can start thinking about, talking about in the comments. How have you experienced God's provision this week? Uh, or maybe in the past couple of weeks. How have you experienced God's provision? Maybe in unexpected way. So start throwing some answers to that in the comments. Feel free to interact with each other as you do, uh, and we're going to dive in. But before we do, let me pray with you. Father, uh, we thank you today uh, that you are present, that you are active, that you love us, that you are in control, and that even though we feel like things are a little out of kilter, we're a little bit off of our routines, uh, we rely on you to know what you're doing. And we are looking for ways that we can learn from all of this, that we can grow from all of this, and so that we can really become the people you created us to be. We thank you for your word. And as we dive into it this morning, I pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds, make us receptive to what you have to say, and change us to be like Jesus. In your name, amen. All right. This morning, we're going to step away from our comeback series just for one week. And uh, what we're going to do is talk about a special topic. And the topic we're going to talk about is God's provision for his children in time of need. All right. Next week, we'll get back to Nehemiah and uh, we'll talk about him a little bit and how he his story actually flows right into the Easter story. So on Palm Sunday, we'll be making that connection between Nehemiah and uh, and the Palm Sunday. Uh, but for this morning, we're going to talk about God's provision. And I'm actually going to start where Alan left off this morning. If you watch the kids, the kids program this morning, you know that Alan talked uh, about Jesus calming the storm in Matthew chapter 4. And I want to talk about that too. I'm not going to spend as much time as he did. And so if you want to watch more, you can go back and hear what Alan had to say. But you remember this story in Mark chapter 4, right? In Mark chapter 4, uh, Jesus and his disciples are in a boat. They're going across the Sea of Galilee, and an unexpected storm comes up. Uh, they didn't know it was coming, and it is a massive storm that threatens to sink the boat. And, and so the disciples are doing everything they can to keep the boat afloat. They're bailing water out. They're rowing as hard as they can, everything they can do to keep the boat afloat. And all of a sudden, they notice that there in the front of the boat, Jesus is curled up asleep. And so they cry out to him. They say, Master! Do you not care if we drown? And Jesus kind of wakes up and looks around, sees the storm, and, and just stands up and says, Peace, be still. And immediately, the storm is gone. And then he looks at his disciples, and he says, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Now, what's, what's cool about what Jesus says here is that he says, Have you still no faith? In other words, have you not already seen enough to know that I can handle this? He's referencing his past provision, his past demonstrations of his power. Say, look, you've seen me heal the blind. You saw me turn water to wine. You've seen me heal the sick. You've seen me do all of this stuff. Do you not think that I can handle a little storm? This is what faith is. Faith is when we are willing to rely or to remember God's provision in the past and rely on his promises for the future. 
when Alan told the story this morning, he, he finished by giving us a big idea. His big idea was that Jesus' power calms our fears. I mean, we could leave it right there, couldn't we? Because we're in a time of life that induces a little bit of fear. It induces a little bit of anxiety. And, and Alan reminded us that Jesus' power, his, his power to say, peace be still, that calms our fears. And I want to build from that this morning and, and, and say kind of, Big idea number two, and the one we're going to cover, is that Jesus' provision meets our needs. Three quick thoughts on Jesus calming the storm before we move on. All right, and I think these are helpful for us. If you feel like you're in a storm today, and maybe it's because of quarantine, maybe it's because of the coronavirus, maybe it's because your business is struggling and you're not sure if you're going to have work next week, or whatever else it might be. If you're in a storm right now, I want you to hear this. Number one. Jesus is not surprised by the storm, right? When Jesus woke up in the boat, he didn't look around and say, whoa, whoa, I didn't see this coming. What are we going to do, guys? No, he knew immediately what he was going to do because he wasn't surprised. And whatever storm you are in right now, Jesus is not surprised by the storm. Secondly, secondly, Jesus is taking you somewhere through the storm. I I want you to latch on to that word through. All right, because Jesus takes us through storms. He doesn't take us into storms and leave us. He takes us through the storm. Right before Jesus and his disciples got on the boat, he said to them, let us go to the other side. You see, Jesus' destination was the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And there was no storm that was going to stop him from getting there. Just like there is no storm in your life that is going to stop Jesus from taking you where he wants you to be. Jesus is taking us somewhere through the storm. He doesn't take us into the storm and leaves us. He stays with us. He takes us through the storm. Third thought, and I I think this is an important one. There is no storm so great that Jesus is concerned, worried, or incapable of taking you through it, right? There is no storm so great that Jesus is concerned, worried, or capable of taking you through it. So whatever the storm is in your life today, Jesus can take you through it. Like Alan reminded us already this morning, Jesus' power calms our fears. And now what we're going to look at for the rest of this morning is that Jesus' provision meets our needs. Philippians 4.19, we studied this verse last fall in our Overwhelmed series, but Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. My God will supply, he will provide all your needs. Now, if you've been around the gathering long, you know what I'm going to say next, right? God provides all of our needs. However, that doesn't mean he always gives us what we want. And it doesn't mean he always provides our needs like we think he should. And it doesn't mean that he always provides our needs in the time we think he should or the time that we expect. Sometimes God meets our needs and it's something we never thought we needed. And sometimes he never gives us what we want because he knows what we want might not be good for us. However, God always meets our needs. And so this morning... Uh, I want to talk about four ways that God provides for his children. All right? Four ways that God provides for his children. Here's the first one. Sometimes God's provision is protection. All right? This is, this is one that we almost never see or think about, but probably happens more than anything else. You know, God is always protecting us, and usually we don't even notice because we don't know what he's protecting us from. Now, now sometimes... He's protecting us from ourselves. Sometimes he's protecting us from bad decisions that we've made, and he keeps us from suffering all of the consequences of those decisions. Uh, Sometimes he protects us from the bad decisions of others. How many times have you been driving along and there's been an accident somewhere near where you were, and you just happened to not be there at that moment? That's God's protection. God also protects us just from living in a sinful world. There's a lot of brokenness in our world that happens, and God protects us from that much of the time. I don't know if you've ever seen the television show, I Shouldn't Be Alive. It's one of our family's favorite shows. Uh, Basically, it's about people who make bad decisions and then end up living through it even though they shouldn't. Uh, For example, someone climbs a mountain without the proper gear and gets stuck on the top of the mountain in a blizzard. 
or they drive their car out into the desert without enough gas and they get stuck out in the desert and no one knows they're there. And it's all of these kinds of stories of people who make bad decisions and yet somehow they get out of it. And that's exactly how God protects us, is that sometimes we make bad decisions, sometimes others make bad decisions, sometimes the brokenness of the world is all around us and God still protects us. You know, as you're walking around this week, God will be protecting you. Right where you're sitting right now, God will be protecting you. And sometimes we take God's protection for granted. And we need to remember that God's protection is one of his most powerful ways of providing our needs. Right, so the first way that God provides is through protection. The second way that God provides for us is through presence, especially in life's storms. Do you remember the Old Testament story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? So these are these three young men, and they're in Babylon. Uh, remember, Jerusalem fell. They all got carried over. They're friends of Daniel. And so they're in Babylon, and, and they're commanded to bow down and worship an idol of the king. And they say, no, because we only worship the one true God. And so as a result, they are punished by being executed. They're going to be thrown into what's called the fiery furnace. And so these three young men are thrown into the fiery furnace, and God protects them. He doesn't let them burn up. But also, this amazing thing happens. God is present with them. It, the, the Bible tells us that the people who were watching looked into the fire, and instead of seeing three, they saw four because God was with them. It's this powerful idea that in the fieriest trial of their life, God was present with them. And, and while we may never experience exactly what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego experienced, we also experience God's presence in the fiery trials of life. We also experience God's presence when we're in the storms of life. You know, it's human nature for us to want someone else to be present with us. Uh, from the moment a little baby is born, if you, if you take that little baby's hand and you put your finger in their hand, what will they do? Immediately they'll curl their hand around it and hold tightly because we are born desiring presence. What a powerful reminder to us that, that our God never leaves us alone. He never leaves us, not in the storms, not in the fires, not in the calm. He never leaves us. Psalm 23 says, even though I walk through, there's that word again, through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, he is with us. And he walks where with us? He walks through it. He doesn't walk into it and leave us there. He walks through it with us. Listen, you may have some storms coming. You may have some fiery trials coming. You may have health issues. You might get sick. You're, you might lose your job for a while. You might struggle. It, it might just be a fiery trial for you to be quarantined for a long time. Uh, whatever it is, whatever the storm that you go through, I want you to remember that part of God's provision for you is his presence. He's there with you. Hebrews reminds us that we have a high priest that has suffered just like us in every way. God knows exactly what you're dealing with because Jesus has dealt with it himself. And he's gone through it, and now he's going through it with you. God provides for us by being present with us in life's storms. And, and here's the third thing, is that God also provides for us by giving us purpose on the other side. Of the storm. This is what James 1 teaches. Remember in James 1, James says, brothers, rejoice when you suffer. <laughs> rejoice in every kind of trial because you know that it's through your trials that you grow. It's through your trials that you become the person you were created to be. It's through your trials that God makes you complete. And, and so there is purpose in life's storms. There is purpose in your suffering. There is purpose in the fire. You know, I, I often say that life is best understood in the rearview mirror. Sometimes when, when life's coming at you, it's hard to know exactly what it all means, and it's hard to understand exactly what's going on. And, and especially when you're in the middle of the storm, it's really hard to get a sense of why you're here. And it's really hard to feel like, is there any purpose to this at all? Because it doesn't feel like it. But once you're through it, and you can look back and say, what was, what was that all about? You begin to see... God had a plan. God had a purpose. In fact, you talk to most people who have been through difficult trials. 
And they will say, yeah, on the other side of it, I can see what God was doing. I, I've told you my own story uh, that eight or nine years ago, I went through what was one of the toughest times of my life. It was a dark time when you know, I felt abandoned. I felt alone. I felt like some of my best friends had left me. Uh, just seemed like everything that could go wrong went wrong. But it was because of all of that that happened that I eventually ended up at the gathering. And looking back, I could see how all of those things that God allowed into my life were preparing me to be your pastor. And, and at the exact same time I was going through much of that, some of you were going through really similar things here in Ohio and, and preparing you for me. And so that when we were able to come together and be connected for that first time, I felt like this is the church that God has prepared me to pastor. And, and I am the person that God has prepared this church for. And it was this powerful reminder that even in the darkest of times, God has purpose. He has purpose for our suffering. Now, here's the thing. Some people choose to never see that. They simply choose to, to be bitter about what's happened in their past, to hold on to grudges, to hold on to the pain and never let go of it. And, and if you do that, you'll never discover the purpose in the storm. You see, suffering will either make you bitter or better. And you get to make the choice as to what your perspective will be. Will you look for suffering to make you better? Will you find the purpose? Or will you allow suffering to make you bitter? Now, sometimes... Sometimes God's provision looks very different than any of this. Sometimes it's protection. Sometimes it's his presence in the storm. Sometimes it's purpose on the other side of the storm. But listen, sometimes God's provision comes in the form of promotion. He brings us home. Sometimes death is God's provision for his people. Now, now we get tripped up a little bit here, don't we? We... We don't like to talk about death, and especially right now, we don't like to talk about death because we're seeing this, this virus that's spreading around the world, and we're seeing these incredible numbers of people who are dying. And so we look at this, and this is foreign to us, and this is hard for us to hold on to, especially in first world country like America, where death is kind of this distant, detached idea. And it's not like that in third world countries. It's really a part of their life. But I want you to understand, for the children of God, death is not our enemy, all right? Death is, is not this horrible thing that we have to fear. Now, death is painful, right? No one, no one wants to lose a friend. No one wants to lose a family member. No one wants to lose a loved one. And, and Jesus himself mourned when one of his best friends, Lazarus, died. Remember John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. Why did Jesus weep? Because he knows that the process of death is difficult. He knows that the sense of loss we experience when we lose someone is profound and he wept with us. So it's okay to mourn and it's okay to grieve, but understand that death is not our enemy. In fact, sometimes death is provision. There comes a time for all of us when God says, you know what? You, my child, it is better for you to be here with me than to be there on earth. Let me, let me read to you a couple of Bible verses about this issue, all right? Let me start in, in Romans 8, where Paul reminded us that even in death, we cannot be separated from the love of God. He said, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Nothing in life and nothing in death. You see, death doesn't separate us from God. Death separates us from sin. Death separates us from brokenness. Death separates us from disease. Death separates us from the evils of this world, and death connects us to God. That's why we don't grieve death like those who have no hope. That's 1 Thessalonians 4. We don't grieve as those without hope. We actually have hope. What is our hope? We have this blessed hope that death means we are with God, and we are with those who have gone before. And a beautiful, incredible reunion. Psalm 116 says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Do you hear that? When we die, that's a precious moment to God. Because that's when we shed everything that keeps us from him. And we are united with him fully and wholly in the relationship we were created to have in the beginning. 
finally, in 2 Corinthians 5, we're reminded that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. See, that moment we step out of this earth and we step into eternity, we are with God. How great is that? You see, here, here's the formula that, that we sometimes forget about death, is that when we die, when God brings us home, God is no longer present with us in our suffering, but we are present with him in his perfection. Do you get that? We are no, God is no longer present with us in our suffering, but we are present with him in his perfection. And, and that's why sometimes promotion to our true home is one of God's greatest provisions for us. So I have to bring in Lord of the Rings today, right? I, I noticed yesterday on the Facebook page there was a conversation about this. And you know I love Lord of the Rings, even if Pastor Steve doesn't. But uh, at the end of, of one of the Lord of the Rings, uh, the, the great city of Minas Tirith is about to fall. The orcs have, have conquered five levels. I know I sound like a nerd, but some of you love this stuff. And, and they're about to break through the gate and take another level. And Gandalf and Pippin, who are two of the main characters, are sitting there together talking about what's next. And Pippin says... I didn't think it would end this way. To which Gandalf replies, end? No, the journey doesn't end here. Death is just another path, one that we all must take. The gray rain curtain of this world rolls back and all turns to silver glass, and then you see it. And Pippin looks at Gandalf and says, what? Gandalf, see what? And Gandalf says, white shores and beyond a far green country under a swift sunrise. Pippin thinks about it for a moment and says, well, that isn't so bad. And Gandalf says, no, no, it isn't. Now, I, I don't know if Gandalf's description of heaven is accurate. It's probably not. It's probably much better than that. But I think his conclusion is spot on when he says, no, no, it isn't that bad. God's children need not fear death because it is God's ultimate provision to bring us home. So this morning, there's lots of questions we could ask, right? We, we live in a time when there's a lot of questions. We don't know how long this quarantine is going to last. We don't know how long this virus is going to be spreading. Some of us are asking the question, well, how is God going to provide for me this week? And that's a great question to ask. I promise you he will. But the real question I want you to ask this morning is this. How do I become a child of God? Because the most important part of what I'm saying this morning is that God provides for his children. All of these promises we've talked about this morning, these are for God's children. And so the most important question you can ask this morning is how do I become a child of God? How do I become God's daughter? How do I become God's son? So that I can expect and believe in the promises of God. Well, let me give you a couple verses. First from John chapter 1, verse 12. John says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You see, there's two key pieces here. It's John says, those who receive him and those who believe in his name. Do you believe that Jesus is the king? Are you willing to submit yourself to his authority? To say, Jesus, your way is better than mine, and I give myself over to him. And, and do you believe that he is your savior? That he has given you a new life? Are you willing to receive that from him today? You see, if you can believe that Jesus is the king, and you can receive his salvation, then to you is given the right to be a child of God. That, that's all it takes. Believe that he is the king, and receive the new life he offers. Let me, let me close out with one more verse. This is just a beautiful verse that John wrote in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And this is kind of like his promise to God's children. He says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. God loves you because of Jesus he has adopted you, and he has made you his child. The reason why the world does not know us, see, not everybody understands this, is that it didn't know him. 
People who don't know God can't understand what it's like to be God's child. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. So John said there's there's something more beyond this life, and it's much, much, much better, right? But what, it, what we are going to be, we're not yet. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. This is the bright future that Jesus has for us. That as God's children, he promises that one day he will return. He will restore all things. He will make all things new. And we will be like him. We will be the people that God created us to be for eternity. What a wonderful, powerful promise that is. I want you to hold on to that promise this week. All right. I want you to remember that God loves you more than you have ever been loved. That, that God has filled your life with all of his goodness. He's poured his grace and his mercy and his kindness and his peace and his joy and his hope, all of that into your life. And he's done that so you can be filled with his love and overflow into the lives of everyone around you. So whether it's on social media or whether it's your family that you're quarantined with, or if you're still working, whether it's your coworkers, whoever you come into contact with this week, allow yourself to overflow with God's love, with God's hope, with God's peace, with God's kindness, so that you will impact the world around you, so that you will brighten the world of everyone you meet. Let me finish up by praying with you. Father, I thank you so much for all that you've done. I I thank you for the promises that you've given to us. I thank you for uh, the, the power that you have to restore us. Help us to be your people. Help us to rely on you. Help us to not give in to the stress and anxiety that we feel. In your name, amen.